Thank you. We're doing it now. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so um, the first thing I want to do tonight is acknowledge the jury who decided these awards. This year we have several new jurors, and along about the middle of last December, one of them came to me with some concern. She said, I want to get a head start on the reading, but there are only about 20 or so books in my category. You know, are, are there not going to be very many books? And I said, um, just wait. Just wait until about December 31st, which is the deadline. And the deadline will come, and you will need a truck to take the books home. And indeed, we receive an avalanche of books for the California Book Awards. Uh, there are literally hundreds of books in each category that we read through. Our jurors are librarians, editors, authors, professors, people who take the responsibility of evaluating books very seriously indeed. We read as if these were our own books being judged. The labor and care of the jury is an act of great generosity uh, towards the larger community of readers and writers that we serve. So I'd like to ask the members of the jury who are here to just stand up for one minute while I name you. Not, they're not all here, but most are. So, Thank you to Alden Mudge, Roy Eisenhart, Peter Fish, Catherine Ma, Christopher Chen, Sarah Rosenthal, Carla Kozak, Rosalind Chang, Stephen Somm, Gabrielle Sells, Allison Bartlett, Denise Newman, Julia Flynn Seiler, and Michelle Richmond. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Gloria Duffy, who is the president and CEO of the Commonwealth Club, George Dobbins, who is always a pal, program director. Betty Bullock, who runs that wonderful book um, club, book, book reading group based on these book awards. And Alex Rodriguez, who brings clarity and support to this very event. And above all, most especially, I want to thank my dear friend, Renee Miguel. I know my fellow jurors thank me um, in thanking her. She cultivates a feeling of collegiality and mutual endeavor. She loves literature. She's an all-around great gal, and we really love Renee. Thank you, Renee. So I'll just say one brief thing. I could go on. I'd love to go on because there's an incredible richness of books that we're honoring tonight. And every year that we end up with these award winners from this vast amount of books that come through, uh, oddly and interestingly, a theme emerges in the winners. And this year, in, in book after book after book, we, we're confronting some of the most horrible uh, truths about history and human um, impacts on each other and on ecosystems and on you know what this endeavor of human life is on Earth, that um, you know just just really really hard stuff to look at, and these writers have delivered us this information in a way that just says yeah we're gonna we're gonna do this together we're gonna confront it, and we're gonna move forward with with new information about what we've done in the past and what the human being has been and what we hope the human being can be in the future. And I don't think that this occurs in any other way besides the written word, right? I mean, other art forms touch on it, but this comprehensive way and, and the history and the testimony that is in words is, is really singular. So this is what we're celebrating tonight. Now we'll flow right into the awards after we make one brief stop over to acknowledge Kevin Starr, the California historian who died this year. And to do that, we are very uh, pleased to welcome Steve Wasserman, editor and publisher of our beloved local heyday books, to make some remarks. Thanks. It's really a great uh, privilege to make some remarks about Kevin. I met Kevin um, 42 years ago, not far from this location. I was just starting out as an assistant editor at City Magazine, and his great schoolmate, one year ahead of him at the University of San Francisco, Warren Hinkle, said, you have to meet Kevin. He knows everything. So we met in the Bohemian Club. 
Now, of course, I had been schooled to oppose almost everything the Bohemian Club had come to stand for, uh, except for its uh, Bohemian origins. Uh, and when I met Kevin, who was uh, uh, decked out uh, sartorially in uh, the uh, bow tie he affected to wear, uh, even to the last time I saw him, um, I thought he was a member of the ruling class, but I was wrong. He was a self-invented fourth-generation San Francisco whose father was a machinist and his mother a bank teller and who grew up partly in an orphanage in Ukiah. Uh, and who had gone to school at Harvard, and despite having gone to an Ivy League school, never swallowed the Kool-Aid and always remembered where he came from. And where he came from was this extraordinary place called California. And he, uh, uh, about 120 years after the great H.H. H. Bancroft, who uh, began to compile his marvelous 39-volume history of, of, of California, a history that was in the making as he lived and watched it, 120 years later, Kevin knew that this was a great story and it needed a modern chronicler. And in his eight volumes, which are an indispensable work and will stand for a very long time time is a monument to, how to put it, Anglo unease with race and sunshine in our ruined utopia. And it is testament to uh, Kevin's uh, perspicacity that he was alive to the ways in which the literature of California from, let's say, Nathaniel West to Joan Didion is now being eclipsed by other voices from other places, from Mexico, from Seoul, from the former Saigon, and that these new voices, which account for a chorus of reinvention as we invent a newer uh, California for the 21st century, that theme began to be a kind of drumbeat in his later works as well. I last saw Kevin this past fall. I was having lunch with uh, Pete Bancroft, the uh, great grandson of uh, his, uh, the founder of the Bancroft Library. And there we were at the Pacific Union Club, a club that I never thought I would gain entry into. And indeed, it was my first time. And I looked over at the other table. And there was Kevin Starr sitting there holding court with a, a kind of, you know, Sir Arthur, so a round table of, of folks. I had last seen him delivering the eulogy at Warren Hinkle's memorial in August. Little did any of us know that 90 days later um, he would uh, join Warren um, uh, in that eternal sleep. You know, sometimes history is broke. There, there are cracks in, in history. Uh, there was, you know, BC and then there's AD. There was sort of California before Kevin, and now there's California after his work. And if it can be said that uh, novelists are historians of the present, uh, Kevin was uh, a historian who was a novelist of the past. Let's welcome his spirit here today. Let us hope it informs our deliberations and our thinking as we go forward. We are all of us who personally knew him, blessed to count him a friend. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Allison Hoover Bartlett, and I'm one of the fiction jurors, along with Catherine Ma, Peter Fish, and Michelle Richmond. And I will be presenting the winners of both the first fiction and fiction medals. The other day, while falling down a particularly deep YouTube rabbit hole, I came across a 2004 interview with David Foster Wallace, in which he described what he appreciated most in fiction and what he aimed for in his own work. The perfect thing, he said, would have both a full intellectual aesthetic and an absolutely emotional effect. He called this a star to steer by. It struck me because I'd been thinking about the fiction winners we're honoring tonight, and I think it's safe to say that their authors have indeed been steering by this star. Starting off with first fiction, the gold medal goes to Dog Years by Melissa Yancey. A collection of nine emotionally and morally intricate stories, Dog Years explores the rich terrains of modern medicine and mortality, human dignity and devastation. From the geneticist who struggles with her son's debilitating muscular dystrophy and her role as a researcher, to a medical fundraiser's fraught relationship to the damaged and disfigured, Yancey's characters force us to consider unthinkable choices to feel profound compassion, and thanks to the author's gift for the darkly comic 
to laugh. One of the underlying themes of this impressive collection is time's passing, how we fight it and how we make peace with it. It's a universal challenge handled by the author with particular insight, empathy, and grace. It's with great pleasure that we award the gold in first fiction to Melissa Yancey. Come on up. I'm a fundraiser by profession, and a few years ago, I met with a surgeon who seemed so desperate for my help, I was concerned he was going to bar the door. And I got out of the office only on the condition that I would go to watch a surgery. But I had no idea what I was getting myself into until a few days later when his nurse called and said, come extra early tomorrow uh, so I can get you into scrubs. The doctor's specialty was fetal surgery procedures performed in utero. And the case I watched that day from a distance of about three feet was triplets who weren't even 25 weeks old. Through the scope on the camera, you had access to their entire private world. And I felt like an astronaut. That experience changed me and it made me want to tell stories that were less afraid of the miraculous and of the extreme. So this collection owes a great debt to that doctor, Raman Schmidt, and I want to thank him and the Commonwealth Club for having me here. Thanks so much. Next, moving on to our fiction awards. First, the silver, silver medal, which goes to the Portable Veblen by Elizabeth McKenzie. I think the most common response I heard to this book, not only among my fellow jurors, but friends and acquaintances who've read this book is, I've never read anything like it before. This wonderfully strange and delightfully complex novel is a California story to its core set in Palo Alto, where the protagonist wishes for the simpler, less stat status-conscious Palo Alto of her namesake, Thorstein Veblen. Given our culture's reverence for strivers, her satisfaction with what many would consider a small life struck me and my fellow jurors as both radical and important. The novel is also about wounded veterans, government waste, love, pharmaceutical malfeasance, conspicuous, cons conspicuous consumption, and yes, a squirrel with whom the protagonist converses. I was hoping for a cover. There's a great squirrel cover here. Uh, <laughs> turning the pages of this inventive and very funny novel, readers can't help examining their own values and visions of success. Many congratulations to Elizabeth McKenzie, winner of the Silver Medal in Fiction. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the California Book Awards for their steadfast commitment to literature and writers for so many years. The chair, Mary Ellen Hannibal, the Commonwealth Club, my publisher, Penguin Press, my husband, Steve, my son, Stuart, my friends who are here, my catamaran family, and the rest of you for your interest in this. I began this novel in 2007 with not much more than the desire to write an anti-war novel, drawing on the generational effects of war on my own family and the testimony of veterans of our current wars. Somewhere along the way, a squirrel got involved, moving from a bit player in a lab experiment to a full-blown voice of reason and resistance. And then there was the whole military medical industrial complex to get a handle on in order to skewer it. In my writing group, they wanted to know how squirrels and injured veterans and the writings of Thorsten Veblen related 
when over the course of several years I brought in various strands that truly did not seem to relate. I wasn't yet sure. I had to believe that I would figure it out because somehow they were related through me. But my resolve crumbled more than a few times. I found it very comforting during that time to read about the struggles or deep depressions of other writers. At one point, my son Stuart, who was about 12 then, was trying to comfort me when I said something about how I wasn't sure I could ever finish this novel, that it might be all for nothing. He said then, but mom, if that ever happens, think how much you will have learned about writing. I had a deep feeling of relief then, realizing how right he was, that that would be enough, because I believe writing is a lifelong pursuit with challenges that never quit. I think as a lifelong Californian, I find myself especially proud and sentimental about this acknowledgement, and as if the wiped out person lying on the couch, staring into space with dread, that I have been, and will surely always continue to be, would not be able to believe such a thing could happen to me. Thank you very, very much. Now moving on to The Gold, which goes to Moonglow by Michael Chabon. At its heart, Moonglow is a portrait of the author's smart, tough, irascible, funny maternal, maternal grandfather, from his childhood in the Philadelphia slums to his final days in an Oakland house with a decent view of the bay. The book is a hybrid, a novel disguised as memoir, that draws inspiration and at least some facts from Chabon's own family history. And there's a familial closeness to this book that lends it great emotional warmth and intensity. At the same time, the arc of the grandfather's life leads him through some of the most tumultuous and brutal and hopeful periods of 20th century American history, from the Great Depression to World War II Germany to the space race. The result is a novel that's both sweeping and intimate, and above all, a testament to the power and beauty of storytelling. Many congratulations to Michael Chabon, fiction's gold medal winner. Thank you. Um, I, I can say that since November um, and the recent unpleasantness that occurred in that month, um, I've never been so proud to call myself a Californian. Um, I'm not a flag kind of person, um, but I actually went out and bought one of those. Um, with the bear and the red star and hung it from our front porch on the day after the election. Um, and so to be awarded a California Book Award carries um, an extra weight of um, satisfaction and pride for me um, because I, I, the diversity of voices and people and perspectives and the strength that we derive as a state from that diversity, um, you know, to, to, to be acknowledged when there are so much fine, wonderful writing coming from so many different parts of California and different Californian subcultures and worlds, um, you know, I'm very gratified to have received this recognition. Um, I get asked a lot with this book, you know, how much of it is, uh, how much of it is true, how much of it is, is uh, biographical or autobiographical and how much of it is invented um, and where did you get the ideas in this book and um, I'm not going to answer that question or those questions <laughs> but um, I'm going to talk just a little bit um, about where I got some of the most important things in this book and in and, and so doing a um, a little bit about how books or my books get fed and then hopefully pay tribute um, to a, a, a remarkable Berkeley institution that we are about to lose, I'm sorry to say. So um, when I was writing Moonglow, as with nearly all of my books, I had frequent cause to repair to my neighborhood independent bookstore, the one that is closest to my house. We have some really good 
independent bookstores in my neighborhood, but the one that's right around the corner is Dark Carnival on Claremont Avenue. Dark Carnival specializes in science fiction, fantasy, and horror, but they, they've been there for 40 years and they go very deep and you can find all kinds of authors work there who, who are only marginally might be connected to um, science fiction, fantasy, or horror. Um, writers like Flannery O'Connor, for example, um, who definitely has that gothic streak in her, and I think that was enough for Jack Rems, the owner of Dark Carnival, to think she had a she had deserved a place on the shelves. Um, so, um, you know, with Moonglow, um, there was the space program. There was weird corners of Nazi science and pseudoscience. Um, there was imagery of the space race, um, uh, the sort of quasi-kitschy kind of imagery that many people who, are, who grew up during the years of the Apollo program will remember. Um, there was, um, uh, um, there was imagery derived from tarot cards. There was imagery derived from uh, John Fuseli's um, famous painting, The Nightmare, a painting he painted many times, ghostly horses. And for all of these things, to acquire it, the images themselves or to plunge more deeply into the topics, I would go around the corner to Dark Carnival. Um, and, and the bookstore met my needs uh, every time. On my first morning in the neighborhood, uh, we live in the Elmwood district in Berkeley. This was in April 1997. Dark Carnival was my first stop first morning I was there, um, I considered to be one of the chief glories of Berkeley's Elmwood district. I bought a paperback copy of one of Gordon R. Dixon's Dorsai novels and struck up a conversation with the remarkable Jack Rems that has lasted ever since. For 20 years, Dark Carnival stock and trade has directly fed my imagination and my work, including The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. The Martian Agent, a screenplay that I wrote that was never produced. Summerland, The Final Solution, Gentlemen of the Road, The Yiddish Policeman's Union, John Carter, uh, uh, and Moonglow. Those books don't always have a lot in common, and yet with every book I was able to go to this small, rather cramped bookstore and find exactly what I needed. Um, the twisty warren of bookshelves and the generous, knowledgeable, but never snooty staff of scholar fans have held a place in the hearts and lives of all of the Waldman Chabons. Um, my daughter, Sophie, who's sitting right over there, um, worked at their sister store, Escapist Comics, for two years um, during high school. And I'm uh, just gutted by the news that after 40 years, Jack Rems's Dark Carnival will be leaving town for good. Um, and I just wanted to, if, if any of us need this to be done, put in a good word for the incredible, important role that independent bookstores and independent booksellers play in all of our lives. Um, what an essential part of our little corner of Berkeley, Dark Carnival, has been to think that it's not going to be there anymore is very painful to me. And um, I don't know how we're ever going to um, replace it, but I think that um, support for independent bookstores and independent booksellers ought to be a cornerstone of our eventual California Republic once we, you know, depart from, <laughs> from the union. So thank you all very much. I'm very grateful. Thank you. I'm Carla Kozak, and I'm presenting the California Book Awards in the Juvenile and Young Adult categories. Um, my fellow jurist, Roz Chang, is here as well. We are the initial readers in those categories. The time is 1989. 11-year-old Noah is whisked off to Berlin by his parents, who tell him he is now Jonah. A brilliant boy with a photographic memory, Noah Jonah, is further separated from a mystifying world of secrets and intrigue by his severe stutter. As this outsider finds a friend in the equally isolated Claudia downstairs, shared discovery brings some answers and also warmth and richness to both of their lives. The Commonwealth Club presents Anne Nesbitt 
with the gold medal in juvenile fiction for Cloud and Wallfish. Thank you so much to the Commonwealth Club and to my family and friends, and to everyone here for caring so much about books, and in particular for caring about books for children. As I think you may remember, it's not actually easy to be a child, and especially not so easy when the grown-up world around you is fractured by anxiety and conflict and political tension which was the case when I was little and having nightmares about the Vietnam War, atom bombs, and Nixon, and of course is the case again today, although the nightmares have taken new shapes. It's the challenge of living in historical times. Here's the thing though, books can help us all through. They tell us we're not alone. In hard times, they give us ways to imagine things being otherwise. They allow us to live many different lives, which is really a way of saying that they give us a chance to practice being human again and again and again. Because it turns out that being human is something we do have to practice. So that when history happens to us, we've already thought a bit about things like what we want to be true to and what it even means to be true. Noah, the main character of Cloud and Wallfish, is dragged off to East Germany in 1989 by parents who seem to have been keeping secrets from him all his life. Noah does have a book in his backpack, though, and fortunately for him, it's a good one, Alice Through the Looking Glass. The absurdities of the Red Queen can be helpful when dealing with governments obsessed with surveillance, border control, and Humpty Dumpty-ish propaganda. When Noah makes friends with Claudia, the lonely girl downstairs, he finds himself caught up in a mystery. What happened to her parents? That's part of a larger mystery. What is happening to East Germany? He has to become part of history, and being part of history is sometimes scary and sometimes thrilling, and also, by the way, the scary, thrilling place where today's young readers find themselves right now, living in history. There's a lot of history in Cloud and Wallfish, and that's by design and thanks to the spirit of adventure exhibited by my wonderful Candlewick editor, Kaylin Adair. If you're gonna set a story for young readers in 1989 East Berlin, a time and place they will not have encountered in school, you have to let them in on a lot of cool secrets. When I talk to students in schools, I'm inspired by their hunger for history. They think it's pretty great that in 1989, I, like my character Noah, was actually living in East Germany. They want to know more about the world. They know, as Noah learns, that the only way to find out the truth is to keep asking questions and then to keep asking more questions. Books are necessary like air. Reading and writing are a kind of breathing. We breathe the world in, it mixes with every part of us, it feeds us and energizes us, and then we exhale, and some of us travels out with that breath, with that story. When we hand children books, we are helping them learn to breathe. Probably there's nothing more important or more wonderful than that. Thank you. One day, paths converge. Every decision in the universe, large and small, will affect many others. After 10 years in the US, Natasha is about to be sent back to Jamaica with her family, but she won't go without a fight. Korean American Daniel heads downtown to interview for Yale. Is it fate, coincidence, science, or love that brings them together? Nicola Yoon has written an unforgettable story incorporating race, immigration, family, and so much more. The Commonwealth Club awards Nicola Yoon the gold medal in young adult literature for The Sun is Also a Star. 
Nicola Yoon is unable to be here tonight, but she sent a message of thanks, which I will now read. The Sun is Also a Star is about a poetic boy named Daniel who tries to convince a science-minded girl named Natasha to fall in love with him over the course of 12 hours in New York City. The book is about the ways in which a big love can change your life, both for the better and for the worse. But it's also about the immigrant experience in America. I am an immigrant, and I'm the child of immigrants. When we talk about immigration, the discussion tends to center on politics and policy, but we are not just talking about headlines. We are talking about people. Immigrating to a new country is an act of hope and bravery. Immigrants give up country and family and language, all for the hope of a better future. They want the same thing every, that everyone wants, possibility. I hope that when people read about Natasha and Daniel's journey, they will see a bit of themselves in it. I hope that they will see that as Maya Angelou said in her wonderful poem, Human Family, we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. Thank you so much for this award. Hi there. I'm Chris Chen. Uh, I'm on the poetry. I was one of the poetry jurors, and I just wanted to acknowledge actually the hard work of my fellow jurors, uh, Sarah Rosenthal and Denise Newman. Denise couldn't be here today, but Sarah's here. Um, we read through, we really did read through a truckload of books. It was quite a few, and many of them were quite incredible, so it was difficult to make uh, choices. Um, so uh, the first award. Um, Aja Kushwa Duncan's Restless Continent uh, combines story, diary, dictionary, and archaeological elements to reflect on the violent destruction of the first people's world by white Europeans. Kushwa explores her Scottish, French, and Ojibwe ancestry to express the rifts in her own identity. At the same time, she reclaims her native roots and reestablishes a still extant native reality in the present. Rage, grief, confusion, humor, and tenderness are called onto these pages. Gender analysis and periodic allusions to break up to a breakup entwine with this uh, genealogy exercise, helping to weave a story in which the personal is always political and poetic logic rules. And, and this is um, Duncan. When my tongue split, the earth was broken in two. The Commonwealth Club proudly presents Aja Kushwa Duncan with the gold medal in poetry. So I had this revelation while I was chatting with Douglas that, uh, who I am so honored to be honored with, um, that the, I think the last time I was on a stage like this, I was in a spelling bee in elementary school, <laughs> and I lost, and, and this is actually kind of deep, the word I lost spelling was home, which I have never put together, <laughs> I'm like, huh. So maybe that was the origin of Restless Continent. Where all is known, no narrative is possible. I no longer remember from which of Cormac McCarthy's innumerable novels that I took this line, but I've held on to it for many years. To me, it speaks to the impulse of language to make sense of things. Writing takes this attempt at understanding one step further, for we are always writing to another, an ancestor, friend, unborn child, we write our way through living, and in that way create a narrative of another timbre of sentience. The other line that lives inside of me is from native writer and philosopher Thomas King and his wondrous collection of essays, The Truth About Stories. The line that completes this book's title is, The Truth About Stories is that that's all we are. Our stories are our skin and our teeth, 
Our stories are our invocations and talismans. Our stories are our protection and the atmospheric membrane of our trauma. I am a poet, but more than that category of being, I am a storyteller. And my book, Restless Continent, is a collection of stories. Some are stories of evolution, biologic and intimate. Some are stories of imminent disaster and the involability of this spirit world. Some are stories of the reclamation of language and the loss of another self. A significant amount of writing of the book involved teaching myself Ojibwe on Ashinabe Moen. The language we speak has a profound impact on our ways of seeing and knowing the world around us. The truth, this truth is well known to those who speak multiple languages, to those who straddle different worlds. During this process of learning on Ashinabe Moen, I was struck again and again about English habit of nouning, of making everything an object, something separate from. For a number of English nouns, I found only a verbal corollary in Anishinaabe Moen. One of the most instructive ones is the English word for enemy, a noun. Something that exists, something that can be observed, identified, discovered. In my nascent study of Anishinaabe Moen, I could find only migadeimnim, to think of someone as an enemy or adversary, to construct an enemy, to make someone into something. So what does it mean if one language conveys, perhaps even teaches, the existence of enemies, of people who are by, defined by their desire to cause harm? And what does it mean if another language teaches that to make an enemy is a verb, a state or action, something subjective, something relational. What impact might these different differences have on the nature of the stories, on the nature of those stories we tell? Holding space in the world can be difficult. The stories become us and we become them. Sometimes the stories are very hard to bear. I have many beings to thank for their enduring support, for making this holding easier friends and family, partners and lovers, writers, editors, publishers, hawks, trees, river otters, and mountain scree. But I want to offer you most here and now in the deepest love and gratitude are these words by native author Leslie Mormon Silko from her novel Ceremony. In the belly of this story, the rituals and ceremony are still growing. The only cure I know is a good ceremony. So tend to your stories. They are powerful. Conduct your ceremony well. Thank you. Uh, our second book uh, is by Douglas Kearney, and it's called Buck Studies. In his sixth full-length poetry collection, Douglas Kearney constructs a dense, intricate, rhythmic architecture. The book draws on a rich, black vernacular tradition. A kind of insurgent choral voice emerges from within a vortex of sound. This voice seems to cull stray satch snatches from a language saturated with anti-black violence. Buck Studies unflinchingly refuses formulaic catharsis, and remains committed to a wounded and wounding humor. Kearney is writing some of the most powerful, formally innovative, and politically uncompromising poetry in the US today. The Commonwealth Club is pleased to present Douglas Kearney with the Silver Medal in Poetry. Thank you, Chris. Gosh. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, uh, Commonwealth Club. I really appreciate it. 
I, I also have to say that if I'm going to ever thank a jury, this is the capacity in which I'd like to do so. Um, so thank you for all your hard work. Um, I just want to make sure I don't go too long. Uh, this book turned on me. Um, in 2015, I was nearing the turn-in date to Finn's books for the Book Buck Studies. At the center of the collection, as I imagined it then, were a series of poems that conflated the labors of Heracles with uh, the folk bad man, Stagger Lee. Now, those of you who know Stagger Lee's folk song, uh, there are many variations, but at the center of almost every variation is the murder of Billy Lyons, another black man that Stagger Lee kills. Well, as you can imagine, in 2015, the idea of publishing a book that made its hub image that of a black body over and over and over again, 12 times, was a bit difficult to think through. Not that the idea of black bodies... Uh, as a center of any kind of spectacle of entertainment or catharsis or demonstration of power or art would be new, but it was certainly trending, as we like to say. And so a year before this book came out, I called my publisher and said, Rebecca, I don't think I can publish the Stagger Lee poems. To her great credit, she simply said, okay, well, think about that, and eased back. I immediately began to think to myself, how could I write something that could, if not replace those poems, counter them? How could I write something that would take this theater of suffering that oftentimes centers around bodies of darkness, differentness? How could I take that and in some way reject it or speak back to it? And so I began to think of the most famous sufferers in all of Western culture. So I immediately thought of Jesus. <laughs> and I thought as one does, what happens if Jesus, during the Stations of the Cross, that passion play, what if that role were portrayed by a black figure who rejects suffering? Bruh rabbit. It also explains the whole Easter thing in a more satisfactory way than is ever... <laughs> been explained to me before. Um, and, that, and that idea led to Ecce Caniculus, which answers those poems. I bring that up because not only to talk about something that changed in the path of writing this book, but to also demonstrate that what I thought was happening at this linear level, and many of us, I imagine, in this room feel happens all the time, that we fight ourselves through our writing, that we do that thing that you pointed out, Anne, which is to practice it being human. The idea that a book in which I get to have that fight, not at the poem level, but at the macro level of the entire book, would be chosen by this committee um, to stand alongside Aja's tremendous book is a deep honor. Thank you all. I dedicate this to my father who died earlier this year. I'm Julia Flynn Seiler, and I'm very honored to present the California Book Awards in Nonfiction. The story of Native American enslavement by Europeans has been a truth largely untold. From their earliest encounters with the North American continent, conquistadors and missionaries kidnapped and enslaved Native peoples, forcing them into harsh labors that helped build the New World. This native slavery continued under various guises for centuries. The practice of slave taking and trading among tribal people themselves has been obscured. Understanding it requires us to examine not only racial prejudice, but even more generalized attitudes towards the value of other people's lives. Andre Resendez has illuminated a vital dimension in the annals of American historical and moral knowledge. The Commonwealth Club proudly awards Andres Resendez the gold medal in nonfiction for the other slavery.
It is a humbling experience to be here. I am uh, deeply honored to be at the podium um, today. So um, I just want to say briefly that the other slavery builds on the insights and information excavated by many scholars working all over the Americas, including another uh, fellow um, recipient of an award today. So some um, of them are friends and colleagues, many others I only know in print, but I want to take this opportunity to thank them all. The act of writing history may seem lonely, but it, it is always the result of a group effort, and it is, this is very much the case uh, today. I also want to dedicate this award to my family, uh, my children, Samuel and Vera Resendez, uh, to my mother, Maria Teresa Fuentes, and brother, Mauricio, who both live in Mexico, and to the love of my life, my wife, uh, Jana Remes, who is um, here with us, and who has accompanied me through this adventure of life for more than 30 years now. I could never have done it uh, without her. Uh, thank you so much. Um, all along when I was writing this book, I kept thinking about the lives of literally millions of Native Americans who lived out their entire lives as slaves. And their subjugation was so complete that uh, their condition has even been erased or largely erased from the historical record. And a word like this makes their voices finally heard. Thank you all. Thank you. Jordan Fisher Smith, Engineering Eden. What is natural in national parks, and how should humans interact with it is both a philosophical and a practical question. Smith finds a story that has been hiding in plain sight and uses it to query how Homo sapiens and other species can and should coexist, weaving the drama of grizzly bear attacks in Yellowstone with an equally grim tale of institutional impasse Smith's tale is lightened by appreciative descriptions of dynamic wilderness. The Commonwealth Club presents Jordan Fisher Smith this silver medal in nonfiction for Engineering Eden. Thank you, Julia. Uh, and Julia, as, as you may know, is a, a very, very fine nonfiction writer in her own right. Thanks so much to uh, Mary Ellen, and particularly tonight in the, um, during the reception, I had a chance to talk to some of you, you in the jury, and I really had no idea what you had uh, offered to do and the extent of the work involved. And so I very, very much want to thank you jurists who read, what, 30 plus books in Something? Huh? More than that, 60? But I mean, this was a huge enterprise, and I, I really had no idea, so thank you so much. I am so honored to be, um, to be to, well, for Engineering Eden to be recognized uh, in this, the city of my birth. I've lived most of my life now in the Sierra Nevada. Um, I was in the snow yesterday in a big snowstorm. And, <laughs> And now here I am, and um, you know, it's, San Francisco continues to feel like home to me, although I really only lived here for the first year of my life, and then grew up on Mount Tamalpais across the other side of the bay. Um, but uh, you know, this is such a place to be just a little bit associated with. I, I think I was born at, at St. Luke's. Was it Franklin or St. Luke's? You were born at what? This is my brother. Okay, so I was born at St. Luke's, and uh, and, and this continues to be, for me, a city I'm so proud of, to be associated with a city that, you know, you know in um, uh, hatred and xenophobia have become something people are proud of in a lot of places right now. And San Francisco continues to stand for this kind of inclusive, tolerant prosperity, commonwealth, that we are all going to get there together or we're not going to get there at all. And uh, thank you to this city. This city, like, like the settings on my monitor that I work on every day, is set to millions of colors. So I was, uh, 
As, as some of you know, who you judges, maybe who the jury people who uh, read Engineering Eden, the central story is about the death of a single person in, uh, in Yellowstone National Park in the middle of the f celebration for the 100th anniversary there. Uh, this guy, Harry Walker, was dragged away into the woods and killed by a grizzly bear. Um, and I was, you know, you nonfiction writers, or I suppose fiction writers too, will know that you have to know a lot more than you end up putting in your book, don't you? Um, you end up having to know more in order to be credible about the part that's in the book. And I, I needed to find the only person who was present and witnessed this death. And uh, Philip, Philip's life, he felt a great sense of guilt after this death. He was the person that had the knife. Um, he was accused by the dead man's family of not using it to defend the dead man against the bear. And to make a long story short, some, uh, some things that were already moving in his life kept going. And by the time I set out to find Philip, he had, be, you know, he had been become a homeless alcoholic with an extensive criminal record in Alabama. So I hired this uh, Alabama private investigator to find this guy. And for about a year, this guy, the investigator, tracked Philip by his jail commitments and his arrests and his contacts with law enforcement and his prison commitments. And, you know, all the paperwork was kind of like the dry leaves you find on your patio after a night wind, you know. By the time you walk out there in the morning and find the, the, the leaves, you know, the wind is in the next county, and we just weren't finding Philip. So eventually I went to Alabama and did the kind of shoe leather, shoe leather version. Malcolm, <laughs> I just saw you back there. It's nice to see you. <laughs> it's an honor to be in this room with a person like Malcolm and everybody else here. Um, so anyway, uh, I just went and did shoe leather, you know, like I'd done when I was a park ranger, and eventually found one of his sisters, and you, in fact, tracked the sister's old address two addresses ago, eventually found her, and she uh, told me where Philip was. So he was in, a, in the southern end of the Appalachians in this town where basically the mills had all closed, and, uh, and anybody who had the money to leave, the gas to leave, had already left. And everybody else were there was on methamphetamine and had warrants out for them. And I called the private investigator and said, good news, I found him. And I'm going up there. And he said, well, are you armed? And I said, and I said no, I'm, I'm not armed. And he said, well, you know what that place is famous for. And I said, no. And he said, well, people like Philip. But, it, you know, I went up there and, and he was actually, he was dressed in camo like everybody else up there. But he was a uh, uh, you know, kind of a sweet guy, and, uh, and he filled in the blanks. I suppose I should say that the story actually goes back a little farther than that. When I finished the book tour with Nature Noir, you know, I had been thinking and putting away notes for a couple of decades about a book, how when nature is disrupted by human activities, how the rangers and scientists who ma manage and operate national parks and wilderness areas make them whole again. And, uh, you know, since it was used in the first laws making national parks and wilderness areas, the word natural uh, had become uh, understood by everybody to mean in a state approximating untouched by human beings. But by the time, you know, you know um, the 137 pages of the, of the management policies of natural areas for national parks have that word natural or variance like naturally in them 500 times. So it was an anchor for our perceptions about how we're trying to manage these places. But by the time I started this book, the general embrace of by everybody in science of the fact that we were engaged in, in, in the process that had created global climate change was making natural kind of hard to find. And so I, I set out to write about these people doing this thing anyway, which seemed to me to be so heroic. Um, I traveled all over the place in wilderness areas for several years studying with scientists on boats and in bush planes and on foot, studying how they were working. And, um, uh, you know, I, t I did all kinds of things that aren't in the book. I, I hiked a smuggler's trail across the Mexican border. Um, it was a terrifying experience. Uh, I, you know, at one point I collided with a submerged alligator in a heavily loaded canoe in the, uh, 
in the Okefenokee Swamp. I went to the Arctic twice. None of that's in the book. But, uh, you know, in 2009, when I was doing this, this piece for Discover Magazine, I found this box at Yellowstone National Park containing these trial transcripts for this obscure federal case I'd never heard of. And it was this guy who'd been killed by this grizzly. And that ended up being sort of the unknown center of the book. Um, and, uh, and as I leafed through these old trial transcripts from a federal court in Los Angeles, I found two of the greatest wildlife biologists of the 20th century testifying against each other about how you make nature whole when it's been broken and what happens if you get it wrong and somebody gets killed. And I was, I was hooked. So um, that journey you know, is how I ended up in that town trying to find this guy with this criminal record. Uh, it's how I ended up tracking down the Montana farm girl that Harry, the dead man, had met three days before his death and fallen in love with. And it took me a year and a half to get her to open up. She was traumatized by the whole thing and tell me that they'd had their first kiss the night of his death. Um, so this is their book, and it's the book of American Wilderness, and thank you very much. Can we go over here now? Hi, I'm Gabrielle Sells. As a member of the nonfiction jury of the California Book Award, I'm here to present the award for the category of Californiana. In American Genocide, Benjamin Madley makes the case that what occurred on California soil in the late 1800s qualifies by international definition as genocide. The mass murder of native Californians by white settlers during the gold rush and after was not just homicidal bloodthirst gone wild, but was in fact sanctioned by a nascent American government eager to settle white people on Indian lands. We are confident that Madley's exquisite, wrenching, deeply researched book will aid and abet future scholarship, even as it helps us face the litany of Indian killings that occurred right here in our backyard. Congratulations go to Benjamin the Madley, the gold medal in Californiana. Good evening. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who organized these awards, who read all of the books, and who put this event together. It is a tremendous amount of work, and we are all grateful for what you have done. Tonight, we're in Indian country. We're sitting in Indian land right now, here in San Francisco. Ohlone Indian land, to be specific. In fact, wherever you go when you leave this event this evening, when you get on BART, and you ride to the south or to the east, where you get in your car and you drive across the Golden Gate Bridge, you will be in Indian country. If you go to the airport, if you're leaving from here, and you fly to the tip of Patagonia, or you fly to the shores of the Arctic Sea, you'll still be in someone's ancient, ancestral, national homeland. Tonight, I want to talk a little bit about the genocide that took place here in California Indian Country. Between the years 1846 and 1873, California's indigenous population plummeted from some 150,000 to just 30,000 people. Diseases, dislocation, starvation, and exposure all played important roles in this cataclysm. But there was also something more sinister at work, abduction, unfree labor, mass death on federal Indian reservations up and down the state, homicides, battles, and over 370 separate massacres. This was, in fact, a case of genocide. The state of California passed laws denying indigenous people rights and protection. 
They also launched 24 separate militia campaigns that killed at an absolute minimum 1,300 California Indian people. Our state legislature also raised over $1.51 million to fund these operations. Working in an environment of state-imposed impunity, private vigilantes killed over 6,400 Indian people during these years. Meanwhile, Congress gave the state of California over a million dollars to reimburse the Treasury for its past expenditures on Indian hunting. They rarely protected California Indians, and they supported the United States Army, which killed at least 1,680 California Indian people and perhaps as many as almost 4,000. Ultimately, genocide spread across the state of California from south to north like a gigantic bloodstain. This book, which you'll see does a good job at propping open doors, was over a decade in the making, and it would not have been possible without support from dozens of people. You know who you are, many of you are here in this audience, from my father in the third row to Malcolm Margolin in the second to last row. It takes a village of people, truly, to write a book. Scholars, activists, and especially California Indian communities shared and made this book possible. And to all of these people and communities, I offer my deepest thanks. The dark specter of genocide hangs over the state in which we live. But the survival of California's first indigenous peoples is nothing short of miraculous. California Indian people survived against all but impossible odds, and it is to them that I dedicate this award tonight. Thank you. Okay, now for the final award of the evening, I'm gonna introduce two words that hardly know each other. Exciting and textbook. <laughs> okay, Ecosystems of California is a compilation like no other before it. More than 10 years in the making, it is the work of more than 40 contributors. As the title promises, it enumerates all the ecosystems of our state, which is one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. The book also covers geologic and, and climate cycles and human impacts over time. It includes the traditional practices of California Indians before the European incursion and subsequent changes to the land and water. A model for how to conceive of and grapple with time and space in a biosphere over a vast region, it is a monumental achievement. The Commonwealth Club proudly presents Harold Mooney and Erica Zavaleta with the gold medal in contribution to publishing. Benjamin, you depressed the hell out of me. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, the book that we wrote, together with 40 other senior authors, um, covers a lot of mater material. California is a really special place. It's unlike any other place in, in, the, in the country, and it's like many, it's like a, unlike other places in the world, actually. Uh, so please observe it and appreciate it and protect it. It's one of the global hot, uh, hot spots for biodiversity. It's one of the few places in the world which have this distinction. You have enormous 
diversity of plants and animals and organisms of all sorts. It's um, globally unique, other than having just a lot of species. It has some very different kinds of species. The, the, the only, uh, find, only thing you can find in the world, the tallest tree in the world, grows in California. The most massive tree in the world grows in California. The oldest living tree in the world is found in California. The forest of California had the highest biomass of any forest in the world. So besides all this biodiversity, there's this, the, the only thing you can, only place you can find these things are right here in this golden state. I'm going to go to the second part now, and I'm going to put on my glasses so I can actually see what I say here. <laughs> the, um, you know, the California Current, that's part of California. That's why it's called the California Current. It, it, it drives the climate in California. It blocks off the summer rain that's coming, that, that goes to the east. And it provides this upwelling in the fog that, that provides a habitat for, for redwood trees. It's just a unique place where things happen that don't happen elsewhere. The book about, is about the past of these systems. I'm talking now about all of the systems, the, the natural ones, in quotes, the managed ones, in, and, uh, and the ocean, the land, from the, from the seashore to the mountaintops. It covers all, the vast array of systems that are found in California in a very special way. And it looks at each one. This was, um, it's an edited book. And you don't want a bunch of, of just a pasting together some essays. Each one, each chapter, looks at their system, what the past was, how, it's, how it is managed and looked at at the present, and what the future is going to bring. Because we all know we're in for a, a sort of a rough ride in, ahead. and and what's going to happen in terms of the systems we have and how are they going to respond and be torn apart and, and what's the role of preserves to, and, and corridors for migration during these uh, times of change. The book was written for uh, students and resource managers and the interested, interested public. And it's uh, vast in scope. And, and, and um, I was telling um, Erica the other day that we made a big mistake. We should have taken on Kansas. I mean, think <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a, it would have been a lot a lot easier. Well, one thing you know that we can be really happy about that, that we have a lot of lands. What half the state is in public lands? It's for all of ours in a way, and uh, we've had organizations which have really worked hard to preserve what we have, the Save the Bay, the, the Coastal Commission. These have made protected some of these areas that we all love, and unlike what's happened in other, other states. So it's, um, this is what the book's about. And now Eric is going to tell you what really went wrong. <laughs> oh, one last thing. One last thing. Uh, I, I was told I couldn't uh, uh, thank all the people who were involved. And um, there's a great long list, and if you guys have another half hour after the reception, I'll, I'll go into those, okay. Thank you, and Mary Ellen, thank you for that wonderful description of the book. It was such a privilege and a pleasure to work on this book with Hal, my longtime mentor and friend. And um, uh, we joke a lot about how long this book took and how big it is and in the 10 years that it took for us to make this book. Two of my husband Bernie's and my children were born, neither of whom weighed as much at birth as the book now does. <laughs> um, but as long as that seems, it actually began a lot earlier than that. So 25 years ago as a young undergraduate, I took a class called Ecosystems of California from this dynamic energetic professor named Harold Mooney. And, uh, even then, I mean, I knew that this is this is what I wanted to do, and there was no text for the class, so I was taking notes furiously, and 
thinking that whole time, you know, th these need to be written down somewhere, all these, these stories that Hal um, was telling, and um, I wanted to be part of, of figuring those stories out and part of, of capturing them in some way. So I became an ecologist, mainly of California, and so 15 years after that, when Hal and I started to talk about this, um, I was all in. And so, as Hal said, California is by far, it's by far the most biologically diverse place in North America, and it's this unique global treasure. An early California biologist wrote that there is from end to end of California scarcely a common mile. And so this book is about why that is and what we know about it. And these are stories that we should all know about this place that we live. And what's notable about this story, I mean, there are many notable things about the story, but one of the things that I think is really notable about this story, and I learned so much from that, there are actually 168 people who contributed to this book. There are climate and geology and fire and oceanography and so on that explain the complex ecology of California today, but hugely also there are people and the economic successes and the human diversity and the politics of California society and the fact that in all likelihood the highest human population density in all of North America was here in the Bay Area before Europeans arrived have much to do with the shape of California's landscapes today and because of Hal's vision about not separating people and nature in this book, um, the book reflects that. It also reflects how much this all, all this human history has to do with the successes that California has had at conserving its ecosystems and its leadership in the global conservation arena. And California ecology has always included people. The early scientists who came here understood that. And so the book reflects that. And it underscores that ecosystems aren't just the stage on which society's dramas unfold. They're also the story. And they're a story we're all still writing together. So this award is for them and for all of us who will write the ending. Thank you. That was so beautifully put. Uh, all of you uh, award winners, you always you know, do what good writers do give us wonderful stories, and this evening has been really beautiful. So I'm not gonna take the last word. I'm gonna give the last word to someone who has better words than I am. So I'm gonna give you a few little housekeeping duties or procedures. Malcolm Margolin is gonna come up and say a few words, and then when Malcolm has the last word, Renee would like to have uh, the, all the writers who've won awards kind of convene in a group to have a group photo and all of the jurors to convene in a little group to have a group photo. And then everybody else head on into the room where across You're the hallway. Here. No, don't. Everybody's gonna gather here. Oh, <laughs> don't go anywhere. And, and get, and the back of the room. Back, back of the room, okay. Okay, thank you, Renee, sorry about that. Uh, so Malcolm's gonna speak, and then I will give the gavel three, or actually, will you get bang this three times when you're done? That needs to happen. Okay, so we have a special guest of honor tonight, Malcolm Margolin, who is the retired emeritus uh, founder and publisher and chief domo of everything Heyday Books. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, th thanks. I heard my name called out a couple of times, so I thought it gave me permission to say something. And, th and there are a couple of things I would love to say. One of them is the poet Seamus Heaney once said that the job of a poet is not to comment on reality, it's to create new realities for us. And I think this is what good books do, is they create new re realities for us, and we need, at this moment, we really need new realities. We can criticize the political reality today forever. We need a new reality. And I think the poets and the people are gonna lead us to that new reality. The other thing that I wanna say is that over my years of publishing, I've seen some ma major changes. One of the big changes I've seen is in our use of language. 
when people talk to one another, they use the language of salesmanship. And it's so infiltrated our way of thinking, it's so infiltrated uh, the, the way we address each other, it's so infiltrated. We scarcely know how to talk to our own kids without selling something. And people are just constantly selling something. Even the tone of my voice, I'm trying to sell you something, because we don't know how to talk to one another otherwise. I think that there's a marvelous poem by William Merwin, and he, he says, I want to talk of the forest, I'll have to speak in a forgotten language. And what we need is that forgotten language. And it's the language of, of poetry, it's the language of native people, it's the language that we, 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 we need that new language to, to, we need the language of good writing to get out of our sense of salesmanship. And finally, there was one thing I wanted to say finally. <laughs> oh yes, yes, it is. That I think that when I started publishing in, the, in 1974, I did a, we, we did, did several books on California Indians. We did we had a magazine news from Native California that went out to California Indians. Indians in the late 60s and early 70s were part of the dominant culture's sense of itself. That the Alcatraz had happened. People would you, you go into bookstores. Black Elk Speaks was on the front table, and. Vine Deloria was on the front table. Every house, every hippie household had a picture of Geronimo. And, 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 and Indians, there was something about Indians that were going to lead us out of the Vietnam War and lead us to a new world. For the last 40 years, Indians were invisible. They become visible again. We can see it in the, in, in the awards that were given tonight to several books. We could see it in the support for Standing Rock. I think when the dominant culture gets into trouble, Indians suddenly become, these people look to Indians for, 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 for certain eternal truths. And these are not just truths about environment, they're truths about humanity, they're truths about society. I've, I, I've, been hanging, I've been deeply hanging out with Indians for over 40 years. It's transformed my way of thinking about things. Hey Day has about 50 books on California Indians. We have, we've been publishing this magazine, News from Native California, for 30 years. I think that this, so this, I think we've, we, 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 when the dominant culture first, when the, Spanish, when the Spanish first arrived in California, the first act of colonization was to rename the landscape. They came in and they named the valleys, the mountains, they named the rivers after Spanish saints, they gave them Spanish names. It was the beginning of a cultural erasure. And we now have a chance to, uh, to, uh, to bring that stuff back again, to bring all that knowledge back again when we need it. And I hope people go for it. And, thanks, and I, I, want, I, want, I want to thank the Commonwealth Club for years of support and for this fine work that they do. Thank you so much. This has to be done. The California Book Awards 2017 are now adjourned. <laughs>